But I want to look again at this story here and focus on something different tonight. Look down at verse number 13, where the Bible says, And the Jews' Passover was at hand, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem and found in the temple those that sold oxen and sheep and doves and the changers of money sitting. And when he made a scourge of small cords, he drove them all out of the temple and the sheep and the oxen and poured out the changers' money and overthrew the tables. And said unto them that sold doves, Take these things hence, make not my father's house an house of merchandise. His disciples remembered that it was written, The zeal of thine house hath eaten me up. So tonight I want to focus on this idea of, you know, we looked at verse number 16 really where Jesus was saying, Don't make my father's house a house of merchandise. Why are you selling in church, you know, trying to make businesses um, out of the house of God. I want to kind of look at verse number 15 tonight where the Bible says he had made a scourge of small cords. So he first goes in verse number 14 and he sees what's happening in the temple of God and then Jesus takes time and sits down and makes a scourge of small cords. What that is is he makes a whip. He makes a whip um, and then he goes in with this whip and he drives the people, the oxen, and all the animals out with this whip. I mean, imagine the scene here with Jesus going and, and, and doing this. And not only that, look, there's no indication here that the disciples were in here with him. You know, the disciples were actually watching this and remembering the prophecy in verse number 17 that I showed you last week where, you know, the zeal of thine house hath eaten me up. They actually watched this happen, watched Jesus do this, whip these people and these animals out of the temple and then flip over all these tables and give this lecture to these people. I mean, Jesus, this kind of goes against the narrative of who Jesus really is today. Jesus was angry here. Jesus was very angry. Turn to Matthew chapter 12. Jesus is angry other places in the Bible. This isn't the only time um, when Jesus draw, drives people out of the temple for selling. Isn't the only time that Jesus gets angry in the Bible. I'm not even going to actually go to all the places where Jesus gets angry. We're going to talk a little bit more about that on Sunday morning. But Jesus, look at Matthew chapter 12. Again, just this idea that we're, we're sold today that Jesus is just this soft-spoken, you know, love everybody all the time type of person, type of God. You know, God is being changed today is what you're seeing. The, the, the spirit of God, who God actually is, is what the Bible tells us that he actually is. Look at Matthew chapter 12. Look at verse number 34. Matthew 12, verse 34, we see this one verse, but the context here is the Pharisees just accused Jesus of casting out devils using Satan. You know, and this is where Jesus accuses them of blasphemy of the Holy Ghost. And he, say, he basically says, you know, you morons, he's basically like, you know, how could Satan cast out Satan? You know, what you're saying doesn't even make any sense. But then he gets serious here in verse 34, and he says, O generation of vipers, how can ye being evil speak good things? He basically says, you're just all bad. He calls them a bunch of snakes, and then says, and he's talking to the Pharisees here. He says, you're all bad. He's like, you're a bunch of snakes, and, you know, actually, he's like, you're, you're accusing me of casting out Satan with Satan, which makes no sense. He's like, but you're the snakes. He's like, you're all bad, and nothing good can come from you, is what Jesus is saying here. Look, he's angry at them. Unless you think he was like, oh, generation of vipers. Snakes, please. <laughs> Listen to me. No, he's mad. He's angry. You know, I mean, I'm glad in, in John chapter 2, I'm glad we have the whip. Amen. Because people, that's, that's the importance of the whip and the fact that he was flipping over tables because you can't change that story. You can't make that story nice. You know, he literally sits down, makes a whip, and just goes in there and just takes care, like physically takes care of business. That's who Jesus is, folks. That's who God is. So I want to look at this idea tonight of anger. You know, because we're taught today that things like anger, things like hate, those are just bad things. They're just all bad all the time. I'm going to show you tonight how literally that makes no sense to even the, the person that can just logically think to the first level in, in, in their linear thought process. That makes no sense. But is anger always bad as, as we, you know, we're taught today? First of all, go to Hebrews chapter 4. 
It can't be. We know the answer to that already from the story in John chapter 2 because Jesus got angry. Look at Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 15. Hebrews chapter 4, verse number 15. The Bible says in Hebrews 4, 15, this is a great verse um, out soul winning. This is a great verse to explain um, to people, you know, who Jesus is. You know, because Jesus, you know, this is how Jesus could die for our sins. If Jesus was a sinner, Jesus couldn't die for our sins. Otherwise, we could all just die for each other's sins. Like, I could die for Brother Benjamin's sins. He could die for mine. But Jesus had to be without sin. That's the only way that that sacrifice would be acceptable to God, is if it was a, a sacrifice. This is why, you know, the Passover lamb was without blemish, to picture Jesus that had no sin. This is why it was unleavened bread, that leaven pictures sin. This is why the wine would not have leaven in it in John chapter 2. You see how it all fits together, folks? See how the Bible just all just connects together perfectly? Look at Hebrews chapter 4, verse 15. For we have not a high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities. So the Bible here, this is a great verse because the Bible is saying, it's literally telling us that Jesus was 100% man. He was 100% God and 100% man. You're like, I don't understand that. Isn't it like a pie? Shouldn't it be 50-50? You don't have to understand. You just have to believe it. The Bible says that he was touched with our infirmities, meaning he felt everything that we feel. He was tempted. Look, look at the next part. What was at all points tempted like as we are? So he felt all the you know, the desires, the pain, the suffering, the depression, the anxiety, all these different things. Jesus felt everything that you do as a man, yet, what's the difference? Without sin. Jesus did all that without giving into that flesh, into those feelings, into that temptation, without sin. He did it without sin. He did it perfectly. He did it. He did this human life perfectly. This is the purpose of the millennial reign, by the way, not to give away Sunday. Jesus is going to show us how to do it perfectly. He's like, I told you how to do it perfectly. I told you how to run a nation perfectly. I told you how to run a world perfectly. I guess I got to come there and I got to show you how to do it. Just like he showed us how to live this life as a man perfectly, with all the infirmities, with all the, you say, oh, you know what, though? I just got this problem. You know, my grandpa had this problem and my dad had this problem and I got this problem. He felt all the infirmities that men feel, except he conquered it. He did it without sinning. He did it without giving into it. All right, so we know in John chapter 2 from this verse and other verses, we know that Jesus did not sin. So the narrative, what the narrative of today's Jesus, of the story in John chapter 2, the narrative of the modern Jesus would have been Jesus went into the temple and he saw that they were doing things that they shouldn't have been doing and he went in there and he's like, well, Folks, guys, I, I think that maybe we should do things a little different way. You know, and he goes and he just talks them down. But no, the Jesus of the Bible went in there, sat down, made a whip, threw the tables over, and whipped them out of the temple of God while chastising them as they're heading out the door. He got angry with them. Turn to Psalm chapter 37. So look. Anger definitely can be wrong, and I'm going to show you that in Psalm 37. I'm going to spend a lot of time on that, but anger can be wrong. It can be wrong, but there is a righteous anger. And tonight I want to look at the difference between anger that's wrong and righteous anger. Look at Psalm chapter 37 and verse number 8. I mean, we see here, Psalm chapter 37 and verse number 8 clearly shows us that there is an anger that's wrong. And look, a lot of times the anger that we have as people is wrong. Don't get me, don't, don't, don't get me wrong. But that is the case. And I'm going to show you the difference tonight. Look at Psalm 37, 8. The Bible says, cease from anger and forsake wrath. Fret, fret not thyself in any wise to do evil. So here the Bible is comparing this type of anger here in Psalm 37, 8 with this idea it's used. This anger is used as a source to do evil, meaning what? A source to hurt people, a source to do harm, okay? So that kind of anger is definitely wrong. Now turn to Ephesians chapter 4, though. So you say, what kind of, what kind of anger could be righteous? You know, what does righteous anger 
look like. That's really what we need to see tonight. Because obviously, we're probably not going to get in the exact situation as Jesus walking into the temple of God and seeing a bunch of people, you know, selling oxen there. So what does righteous anger look like? Well, the Bible tells us this. Look at Ephesians chapter 4. Look at verse number 26. The Bible in Ephesians 4, 26 says, Be ye angry and sin not. Showing us right there, it says, Be ye angry. It doesn't say don't be angry. It says, Be angry and sin not. Meaning there is an anger that is not sin clearly from this verse and it says and let not the sun go down upon your wrath so here we see that righteous anger this is the first verse i'm going to show you tonight that righteous anger has a time factor to it turn to ecclesiastes chapter three it has a time factor to it here we see that righteous anger should not be long lasting for us meaning you shouldn't just be perpetually angry at somebody. You shouldn't be perpetually angry at, you know, a friend, your spouse, whoever that is. But it's clear here that there is a time to be angry. In Ecclesiastes chapter 3, in verse number 1, we get this great set of verses here that basically tells us there's a time for everything. So all of these people that teach this falsehood today that you should never do this. You should never be angry. You should never be hateful. You should never be these things that are just painted with this broad negative brush today. It's just wrong. Look at Ecclesiastes chapter 3 and verse number 1. To everything there is a season and a time to every purpose under the, under heaven, under the heaven. A time to be born, a time to die. I mean, look, these are things that you think are good and things that you think are bad. You know, dying is bad, right? But there's a time to die. We're all going to die physically. A time to plant, a time to pluck up that which is planted. A time to kill, a time to heal. Can you imagine? A time to kill, a time to heal, a time to break down, a time to build up. A time to weep, a time to laugh, a time to mourn. You say, what, what, what do you mean a time to mourn? Well, when you go to a funeral, that's a time to mourn. That's a time when, when somebody that you love has died, when somebody that you, you, you love has lost someone, has, you know, maybe you didn't even know the person that died. But you go there because why? Because it's a time to mourn. It, it's, it's, a, it's a sad, negative thing, but there's a time for it, the Bible says. A time to dance, a time to cast away stones, and a time to gather stones together. A time to embrace and a time to refrain from embracing, a time to get and a time to lose, a time to keep and a time to cast away, a time to rend, meaning a time to tear things, a time to wreck things, and a time to sow, a time to fix things, a time to keep silence, and a time to speak. Now look at this in verse number eight. A time to love and a time to hate, a time of war and a time of peace. So there are times for all of these things. You say, oh, we should just love everything all the time. No, there's a time to love and a time to hate. Amen. But beware of anyone who tells you to never love or never hate. Look, I'm telling you, it is a wicked, evil person that says, just remember, you know, this word hate is just misused and abused today. You know, hate, you know what hate means? Hate means to strongly dislike. You know these people today saying, oh, that's hate, this is hate, and that's hate. You know what they're saying? You should never dislike anything. Are you crazy? That's what I would say to those people. Are you saying that I'm to love everyone? What are we seeing today? We're taught not to hate child molesters. Literally, that's what's happening today. Look, don't, don't judge. Don't ever hate. Look, these are evil people that are teaching this. You're supposed to like everything and everyone all the time? What kind of weird, wicked, satanic doctrine is that? It's satanic doctrine. It's the psychopath killer that's telling you, hey, everything's great. Don't hate anybody. Don't hate anything. Because he's wicked. He's evil. Evil people don't want you to hate anything. But God hates evil. And we should hate evil, too. There's a righteous time for getting 
angry. There's a right time. There's a right time. So we see that not only should it not last a long time, our anger in our relationships with each other, but there's literally a right time for it. And obviously Jesus was showing us, you know, what the right time is. So here's some more on timing. You say, well, what do those times look like? Turn to Proverbs chapter 14. Let's look at this idea of, let's get some, let's, let's narrow down the target now. We know it's got a time factor to it. We're looking at righteous anger. I want to make sure that every time I get angry in my life, it's righteous. So we need to figure out what this time that we, you know, are righteous to be angry is. Look at Proverbs chapter 14. In verse number 29, every time we're talking about righteous anger in the Bible, it's very specific to time, to timing, how long it lasts, and how long it takes for you to get angry. Look at Proverbs 14 in verse number 29. The Bible says this. So we see another time factor here. Proverbs 14, 29, he that is what? Slow to wrath is of great understanding. It doesn't say he that never has wrath. He that never gets to wrath. It says, he that is slow to wrath is of great understanding. But, you know, we got the Proverbs coin here, right? We got the, we got the same verse. We got the good way. And then it shows us the exact opposite, the bad way in the same verse. Beautiful. It says, he that is slow to wrath is of great understanding. But he that is hasty of spirit exalteth folly. You know what that means? He's saying, one side you have somebody that's slow to wrath, meaning... They're slow to get angry. They don't just get angry just like that. They're slow to get angry. It takes a while for them to get to that point of wrath. What's the opposite of that, though? He that is hasty of spirit. Look at Proverbs chapter 16. Proverbs chapter 16. I want you to focus on that word spirit there. I'm going to show you what it means. Look at Proverbs chapter 16. Look at verse number 32. Proverbs 16, verse 32. Again, the Bible says, it says, He that is slow to anger is better than the mighty. And he that ruleth his what? Ruleth his spirit than he that taketh a city. You know what spirit here is talking about? It's talking about your emotions. The word spirit here is talking about your emotions. It's talking about somebody that is in control of their emotions. In Proverbs 14, it says somebody that's hasty of spirit, meaning somebody that can't control their emotions, like they just get mad and they just act it out, right? This is why, by the way, this is why an adult should have this under control, but this is why children should not be allowed to throw temper tantrums, because what are they doing? They're, they're just mad. They're mad immediately about something. Sorry, kids, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get you a little bit here tonight, but they're mad about something and they just act out on it right away. You know what that is? That's a hasty spirit. And that needs to be, they need to be taught as young children to control that. Otherwise, they will be adults that are quick to wrath. You ever met an adult that's like that? An adult that just goes from zero to angry in like 0.5 milliseconds. We've all met plenty of people like that. But it's, you know, nobody taught them to, to control their spirit when they were three, when they were four. And so they're just hasty of spirit. Look at Proverbs chapter 15. Proverbs chapter 15, verse number 18. So you think, oh, you know, okay, a kid, a kid throwing a temper tantrum is, is no big deal. No, but it's a really big deal. That could really, literally affect them into their life. That could make them this person that is of a hasty spirit that has no control over their spirit, that is just this person that's just quick to wrath in their life as a 30-year-old. As a and look, if you can't get, you know, it's better to control something, get something under control as a parent when they're three, they're four when they're five than to have a 30-year-old now trying to change, you know, who he literally is. That's a much more difficult task. Look at Proverbs 15, verse 18. The Bible says, wrathful man stirreth up strife, but he that is, again, slow to anger appeaseth strife. So again, it's this idea of being, we want to be people that are slow to anger. People that are, uh, that, that you just don't snap. You just don't snap on people. You, it takes you a while to get angry. Look at James chapter 1. Look at James chapter 1 and verse number 19. James chapter 1 and verse number. You go to James chapter 1. I'll read for you Ecclesiastes 7, 9, where the Bible says, Be not hasty in spirit to be angry, for anger resteth in the bosom of fools. Again, hasty in your emotions. You just let your emotions rule you, and you just get an emotion that comes to you, and you just act out on it immediately. That's being hasty 
in spirit. All right? Look at James chapter 1, verse 19. Again, the Bible says here, it says, Wherefore, my beloved brethren, let every man be swift to hear. So you should be quick to hear things. You should be quick to listen. Slow to speak and slow to wrath. So the things that you should be slow about, you should, be, you should just always be willing and, and quick to listen to things, but slow to speak and slow to wrath. I mean, it makes sense. Jesus got angry here. Jesus got angry in the temple. But it makes total sense because the Bible says in, in all over the Bible that God is angry with the wicked every day. So God is angry with the wicked every day. And he'll, look, one day God will judge this world in his wrath. He will literally pour out his wrath, which is his anger, on the world itself. Turn to Romans chapter 1. I mean, the Bible all over, this is a main theme, this idea that you should just never be angry. That, I mean, people are missing a main theme in the Bible. Why did God have the prophets? God had the prophets not just to prophesy Christ. He had the prophets to go to the nation of Israel, go to the nation of Judah, and be telling them, you better get right because God's angry with you. God's upset with you, and he's going to destroy this place if you don't get right. God's, God's mad, is what the prophets were saying. And instead of listening, the people, they didn't listen, and, and God poured out his wrath. He acted out on that anger. So look at verse uh, in Romans chapter 1. The Bible says in Romans 1.18, the wrath of God, the anger of God, is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth in unrighteousness. I mean, the Bible says in John 3, 36 that the wrath of God abides on the unsaved. It says, but, you know, he that believeth on the Son, he that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life, but he that believeth not the Son, the wrath of God abideth on him. The wrath of God is on the unsaved. It's sitting on them. It's bearing down on their shoulders, and it will be realized if they die unsaved. It will be realized unless they get saved. That's why we need a mediator. That's why we need a mediator. So the Bible tells us in 1 Timothy 2, like, there's one mediator. You know, there's one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus. Why? Because we need a mediator because that wrath of God is down upon us. We need someone to step in and take it off of us. And that's what Jesus did. I mean, look, when you got saved, especially if you got saved as an adult, if you got saved as an adult later in life, you probably had this feeling. I mean, I'm hoping you had this feeling. You probably had this feeling like, like when the wrath of God came off of you, where you were just kind of like, man, that was close. Because you realize that the wrath of God was upon you, and you realize that it's no longer on you, and you're just like, close call. I mean, I remember feeling that, that way specifically when I got saved in my 30s. Just like, wow, I, I feel like, wow, I really slid into home on that one. Missed, you know, missed the tag. I mean, it was, it was kind of like, it was, it was kind of like a butterfly in your stomach type feeling. Knowing that that wrath of God was upon you. You were in danger of hell. And that's how God's wrath is going to ultimately be shown, acted upon, you know, for the unsaved. So there's a time. Let's go back to anger. There's a time for anger. We know that. It should be slow. It should be slow. It should not last a long time, and there's a specific time for us. But what specifically should make us angry? Let's go back to Jesus, back to John chapter 2, and look at verse number 15. Go back to John chapter 2. So it should be slow. You should not just be hasty in spirit and just quick to get angry. It should not last a long time. But what specifically should make us angry? Look at verse number 15. The Bible says, it's interesting because, you know, Jesus took his time here. He, he, made, he literally made a whip. You know, he just didn't go in there and just get, go crazy, like just immediately, like, ah, you know, go crazy. He literally sat down, he made a whip, he methodically did this, and then he went in and he took care of business. Look at verse number 15. It said, he, when he made a, a scourge of small cords, he drove them out of the temple and the sheep and the oxen and poured out the changers' money and overthrew the tables. And said unto them that sold doves, take these things hence. Take, get these things out of here. Make not my father's house and house of merchants. Or merchant. So the first thing that I really want to show you tonight that, you know, what should make us angry, disrespect to God should make us angry. 
People disrespecting the one true God should anger us. You know, we should be willing to defend the Lord. I mean, this isn't somebody right here who just didn't know the rules, these, these people in the temple. They were people that knew the rules, and they were just blatantly defying the rules just so they could make money themselves. And this is, look, this happens in church. This happens in church. As a matter of fact, this is one of the changes I have personally made from the first two years of the satellite ministry to, you know, being a pastor now, where I've consciously looked back at the first two, two and a half years of this ministry, and I've kind of looked at where I feel like I could have done things better. And there was, I mean, let me just tell you something, there was people in this church that were blatantly disrespecting this church. And I just kind of told myself, like, well, you know, I'm just going to have mercy and mercy and mercy and just kind of talk to people and just have mercy. But there becomes a point where the man of God needs to get angry, where people are blatantly doing things, where they've been told again and again. And look, it can become a danger to people in the church. And I've realized that, that I need to be you know, more assertive in certain cases. I'm not talking about with anybody here, but I'm just saying, like, where there's cases where people are just blatantly just throwing something in the pastor's face, throwing something, you know, just against the Bible in the church. Look, the pastor needs to just drop the hammer on situations like that. And, and you know, there's a time when mercy needs to end. Turn to Acts chapter 13. And that's really my main point on, on the second point where we really need to have righteous anger in our lives. Righteous anger in our lives should come when we see danger to others. When we see dangers to people that we love. Look at Acts chapter 13 for a good example of this. Acts chapter 13, look at verse number 6. So there's two sorcerers in the book of Acts. There's the sorcerer here in Acts chapter 13, and then there's the other sorcerer that actually ends up getting saved in the book of Acts. But look at Acts chapter 13 in verse number 6 where the Bible says, and they had gone through the isle unto Paphos. They found a certain sorcerer, but look at this, a false prophet, a Jew whose name was Bar-Jesus, which was with the deputy of the country, Sergius Paulus, a prudent man, who called for Barnabas and Saul and desired to hear the word of God. So here you have this deputy, this governor, this ruler of this, of this, um, this island, and he wants to hear the gospel. But Elimus the sorcerer, the what? The false prophet. Verse number six kind of tells us the difference between these two sorcerers. This guy's a false prophet. But Elimus the sorcerer, for so his name by interpretation withstood them, seeking to turn away the deputy from the faith. That's the difference right there. The other sorcerer, he was just in it to make some money. He was just in it to make some bucks. He ends up getting saved, and then he just doing dumb things, and they just like rebuke him, but he's still saved. He's just, he was just a dummy. He was just a, a con artist trying to make a few bucks. This guy's a literal false prophet. He's a literal, what, what, does Paul, what does Saul say to him? Paul, filled with the Holy Ghost, set his eyes on him and said, oh, full of all subtlety. He's basically calling him Satan right there. He says, full of all subtlety and mischief, thou child of the devil. You know what he just called him? He just called him a son of Belial. He just called him a reprobate. Thou enemy of all righteousness pervert the right ways of the Lord. Now, this is a very specific false prophet example, but Paul got angry here. He got angry. Why? Because somebody was fighting against this man getting saved. This man was actively trying to hurt somebody. He was actively, I mean, he was actively trying to hurt this man's eternity. He was actively trying to damn this man to hell. And Paul, look, that made Paul angry. So in situations where there's danger to those that we love, that should make you angry. I mean, this is a false prophet example here, but, and look, we really need to understand the difference between the false prophet and somebody that's confused. And you really, really need to kind of like look for this out soul winning because you're going to see both. You're going to see both. You have to understand that somebody that's just confused is going to be willing to listen to what you have to say. Somebody that's a false prophet is going to sit there and they're going to be talking to you. 
They're going to be not letting you talk to the other person that's there, and they're going to be coming in and trying to stop what you're saying as, you know, the truth of the Bible, the truth of the gospel. They're going to try to stop that. You need to take that situation seriously and realize what you're dealing with in that case. I mean, that is someone that is actively trying to do harm. Turn to Matthew chapter 23. Again, Jesus here, again, Jesus here calls out the Pharisees and gets angry at the Pharisees for this same reason. Look at Matthew chapter 23 and verse 15. So we see that we should be angry. We should be angry when somebody's disrespecting the house of God. That's Jesus' uh, very specific example. But literally, the, the encompassing thing here is that somebody is actively trying to hurt someone else. That should make us angry. Look at Matthew 23, verse 15. It says, Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for ye compass sea and land to make one proselyte. So he's saying, you go like to all lengths, you'll go all over the place, you'll spend whatever money possible to get one disciple after you, is what Jesus is saying. And when he's made, you make him twofold more the child of hell than yourselves. He's like, you make that person, and this is really, first of all, I mean, how many people think, again, was woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites. No, Jesus is yelling at them. He's yelling at them and he's calling them, he's calling them children of the devil here. And he's literally saying, there's a couple things that you need to realize in this verse in verse 15. He's literally calling the Pharisees children of the devil. He's calling them reprobates here. And then he is telling them that their proselytes become, you know, twice dead just like them. Twofold the 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 child of hell than yourselves. So you know what he's trying to say here? But first of all, he calls a spade a spade here. He just calls it out right to their face because they're hurting people, and they're hurting people's eternity. But he's saying that when these people get a hold of people, they create more children of hell. They create more sons of Belial. You know what he's, he's teaching? Reprobates beget reprobates. You know, this isn't really something that people really want to hear today, but this is why we need to keep reprobates, perverts, all these sickos away from children. Amen. They need to be far away from the most vulnerable people, because what are they trying to do? They're trying to make them a child of hell just like themselves. But let me just say this. Another philosophy, another doctrine that comes from verse 15 here, there is a time when a bad parent, when just a bad parent who is now corrupting their children, you say, oh, maybe somebody's a young child, uh, a young mom or a young dad, and, and, and they weren't raised right, and then they start corrupting their children. Hey, there comes to a point where you need to understand that the, the victim becomes the perpetrator. Where that bad parent, you, you know, we need to stop making excuses for those people and realize, you know what? They're hurting other people now. There is a time for that anger. And that time is when they begin to hurt other people. There's a time when the abused becomes the abuser, folks. We must have anger towards that. Everything is not okay. Everything that everyone does just because they were raised in a bad home or whatever, you know, it comes a point when they own that and, you know, there needs to be anger there. If, if nothing angers you, those around you are in danger. If nothing can anger you. That's, that's, but, but that is what Satan wants. He wants a bunch of people programmed to never get angry at anything, to just completely drop their guard, completely just trust everybody with everything. It's straight out of the pit of, of hell, folks. It, it's, the, it's this lie of no hate, no anger, and it's very, very dangerous today. We say, well, what about non-righteous anger? What about non-righteous anger? There's plenty of that. Yeah, there's plenty of that. I'm sure we all have personally plenty of non-righteous anger in our lives. For men, you know, let me give you some examples. For men, you know, non-righteous anger. 
Maybe you have a stressful day at work. Maybe things are going bad at, at work and you have trouble at, at work. Look, I know this has happened to me. You have like a million things on your mind and you literally just can't get your mind off just stressful things that are going on in your life. And then, you know, you take that home and maybe you get angry at somebody for something that wasn't even, you know, a big deal. But you're just kind of on the edge. Look, that's not righteous anger. That's not righteous anger when, you know, I remember, I remember there was a, even silly things, even silly things. I remember there was a guy that I used to know many, many years ago. And he was an older guy when I knew him. But anything that this guy was doing, and it was always like, it was always like hobby things that we were doing, like fishing or hunting or whatever. And whenever this guy was there, the guy was like, he was like crazy. Like something would break on, on the boat or whatever, and he was just like, ah, ah. You're just like so mad, just yelling constantly, and just, you know, this broke and that broke, and out hunting, he's kicking his dog, and things aren't going right, and I'm just like, this is crazy. It's just like, why do you go hunting? Why do you go fishing? You know, I mean, stuff breaks. <laughs> it's just, I mean, I, you know, that's no place for anger. You know, that's no place for anger, but, you know, you'll find that that's a real struggle for some people. You know, I know, look, if, if fishing makes you angry, don't go fishing. Why would you do that to yourself? I always tell Jacob when we go out fishing, I always expect to break at least one thing. And we're always looking for that thing, you know, and we get things tuned up, and I, it's kind of a challenge to have the right parts when that thing breaks and all this. But then when that one thing breaks, instead of it being an angry, oh, something broke, it's like, that was our thing right there. You know, we found it. We found the thing. We always talk about on the way home, the thing that we broke. What was the thing that we broke? If you don't expect to break things, you know, don't, don't go places. So look, anger can be a struggle for us just as men. Women, turn to Proverbs chapter 21. Turn to Proverbs chapter 21. So these are not, these are not righteous things to be angry about. Stupid things or just even, even it doesn't matter how busy you are or how hard you work. There's no reason to get stressed out and bring that anger to someone that, you know, has nothing to do with it. That's not a righteous anger. Okay, look at Proverbs 21, verse number 9. Women can suffer from this as well. I mean, stress, I mean, for, for women that get stressed, you know, it, it can turn into constant anger over the smallest things. Look at Proverbs 21, verse 9. The Bible says, it is better to dwell in the corner of a housetop than with a brawling woman in a wide house. That means like an angry woman. You know, nobody wants to be around an angry wife, is what the Bible is teaching us here. And really, Proverbs 21 and verses in the Bible for both women and men, it really shows us, though, if we decide to embrace unrighteous anger in our lives, it really shows us the consequences. It really shows us that, like, if you're just an angry person that's just quick to wrath constantly, and you're just like mad all the time over the smallest, tiniest things, if you're a brawling woman, as the Bible says, I mean, people are not going to want to be around you. People are just going to want to be away from you. I remember that guy out hunting. I just wanted to be somewhere else. I, I didn't even really know him that well, but I just didn't really want to be around him. I mean, I didn't want to be in a situation like, I mean, I went fishing with him one time, and I was like, that's good enough. I, I don't need to go into that situation again. But look, People that snap over the smallest things, and, and I know that we all know this type of person, nobody wants to be around them. Look, and as husbands and wives, we should not use anger as a weapon. You should never use anger as a weapon. Husbands, if you feel like you need to use anger to rule your house, you are not ruling properly. It's one thing if you are just wanting something done and you just say something. You know, I've told the kids this a million times. Like, hey, you know, when I have to tell you ten times, I'm going to get angry. That's okay. But we need to just use anger as this weapon to try to just control everyone. I mean, wives should not use anger as a, as a way to con try to control their husbands. Because they should not be trying to control their husbands. But all these will do is just drive relationships apart if you use this unrighteous anger as this sword that you just wield around like some crazy, hasty person. But really, you know, if you want to boil down righteous anger and unrighteous anger, 
A good way of looking at it is righteous anger is, is focused on concern for other people, and unrighteous anger is focused on concern for yourself. You know, why, again, back to the temper tantrum, why do kids throw temper tantrums? Because I didn't get the cookie, or I didn't get the toy, or I didn't, I, 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 I. They're completely focused on something that they didn't get, they're not getting, they're not able to do, whatever. I mean, and they throw, a, they get angry. But that's not righteous anger, because it's focused on themselves. Anger over somebody else being hurt, that's righteous anger. Because it's focused outward. You know, I'm not really getting, you know, what I want. This whole self-pity thing is, is just terrible. Things aren't going my way. You know, I mean, for a man especially, if things aren't going your way, instead of getting angry, why don't you, like, actually make things go your way? Why don't you, you know, pull up your pants, put your belt on and your shoes on, and actually go and make things go your way? That's what a man is supposed to do. Instead of just being this crybaby, it just gets angry and mad and takes it out on everybody else around him. I mean, that's, that's, that's not righteous. And you look, areas you struggle with anger, things that, I think maybe the thing in my life, I'll confess my faults to you all, I think the thing in my life that, that maybe caused me the most anger was working with animals. Don't smile. Working with animals for some reason, just like, I'm not talking about puppies. I'm talking about livestock, hundreds of livestock, when things go wrong, they really go wrong, and like sometimes, boy, I tell you what, it just makes you crazy. But, you know, maybe get rid of the livestock, so I did. <laughs> but anyway, you know, I mean, just like, look though, look into areas of your life and really kind of self-reflect at areas where you get angry in your life and be like, hey, is this, is this something that, you know, I'm angry because I'm self-focused here? If, if it is, it's not righteous anger. And if it's, focus on someone else, it, it, it could be righteous anger. Turn to, um, turn to Proverbs 27. I want to show you one more thing. I want to show you one more thing. You know, you should always be asking yourself why you're angry in your life. When you get angry, especially as a man, you, know, you get angry, you just stop. Look at, be angry. You can be, you know, you can be angry and, and people won't know you're angry. Be angry and sit there for a minute while you're angry and just ask yourself, why am I angry right now? As you control your spirit, calm down, ask yourself why you're angry, figure out if it's righteous or not, and then act accordingly. That's a good way for a man to do things. Like, a man should have control of his spirit. Look, women should too, but I believe men should be better at this. Men should, by nature, be better at controlling their emotions and not letting their emotions take them over and run them. But look at Proverbs chapter 27, and look at verse number 4. Look at Proverbs chapter 27. There's two other words I want to show you that really kind of match up with righteous and unrighteous anger, and that's these words of jealousy and envy. Jealousy, jealousy is literally, jealousy is a good thing, remember. Jealousy, you know, people mix this up in the English language today, but jealousy is good. Jealousy is just being possessive of something that's yours, being protective of something that's yours. I'm jealous over my wife. She's jealous over me. That's okay. God is jealous over you. He's jealous over us. In the, uh, Exodus 34, 14, you know, the Bible literally says, the Lord whose name is jealous. It's literally one of his names. Oh, it's bad to be jealous. Well, yeah, well that's God's, one of God's names is jealous. Now, being envious, so look, being jealous is good, and God is mad at Israel. Why? Because he's a jealous God. God's anger towards Israel, God's anger towards the United States, God's anger towards us when we're not doing what he wants us to do, it's because of jealousy. It's because we're his. We belong to him, and we're not doing what we're supposed to do. So God is jealous. Jealousy produces a righteous anger. But unrighteous anger, look at Proverbs chapter 27 and look at verse number 4. Proverbs 27, look at verse number 4, where the Bible says, Answer not a fool according to his folly. No, I'm sorry, that's Proverbs 26. Proverbs 27, 4, the Bible says, Wrath is cruel and anger is outrageous. See that? But who is able to stand before? Envy. 
totally putting together anger and envy. This is not a righteous anger here. So you need to ask yourself, when you get angry, men and women, husbands and wives, kids, when you get angry, you need to stop and ask yourself, why am I angry? God forbid you would ever be angry over envy. God forbid a brother in Christ would come to you and say, I just got this great promotion, or I got this great job, or I just bought this new house, and I was saving for this for a long time, or I just got this nice car, and God forbid you would say, I, I, he doesn't deserve that car, I want that car. God forbid that would ever come from a Christian. But look, we need to check ourselves on those things. And if envy is ever the source of our anger, we need to destroy it because it's unrighteous. So jealous, good anger. Envy, unrighteous anger. Look, I just want to give you some things to think about tonight. Jesus was angry. There is a righteous anger, and you will be angry in your life. You will be angry many times in your life before you die. If your heart is beating, if, if you're a man that has any testosterone, get angry over things, and you should get angry over things, and you're getting angry over things that maybe you shouldn't get angry over, but you should check your spirit. You should have enough Christian maturity and enough manhood to check your spirit, understand what God wants and what he doesn't want. Be ye angry and sin not. Be ye angry and sin not. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer.